especially, I mean, you hear such powerful stories in this space and it really helps put life in perspective a lot of times. But I also think about as a marketer, you know, listening to what consumers want and providing that good experience. Like as marketers, sometimes we just think we have to do a job, but we actually get the privilege of communicating with people who are spending their time and their money with our brands. And that's really powerful. And we don't always look at it from that lens. Welcome to Beyond Theory, a podcast powered by Meadows Behavioral Healthcare that brings you in-depth conversations from the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. I'm David Gondos. As a marketing strategy consultant and mental health advocate, Nora Snoddy believes in using marketing as a force for good. So how does she help behavioral health organizations educate and connect with the public in a way that breaks down complex issues and fights the stigma that keeps people from seeking help? Let's get out of the abstract and see how this applies in the real world. It's time to go beyond theory. Hi, I'm Nora Snotty. Uh, I am a local Nashville marketer with about 10 years experience uh, with campaign planning, marketing strategy, and marketing analytics. Um, I've lived in Nashville for about six years now uh, and have two adorable little fur babies, Lola and Gaston. So a little bit about me. Yes. <laughs> so from Beauty and the Beast? Um, yeah, that, that's what happened. Uh, okay, yes. Okay, and okay. he's not, he, he really takes on that personality as well. I probably shouldn't have done that. All right. All right. Well, Nora, glad to have you with us Thank here at the Mental me. Health Marketing Conference in yeah. Nashville. Uh, thanks for being with us. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll start with kind of your story, uh, your background, um, and, you know, how you got interested in marketing, kind of talk, walk us through that journey. Sure. So I don't, I never uh, meant to land in marketing. Uh, I am a public relations and art history major. I thought I was going to go work for a museum, um, let alone a B2B tech company years down the road. Um, so it wasn't really in the plan. Um, But one thing, you know, things just lined up for me really nicely. And I credit it all to networking with people and talking to people uh, and being open to new opportunities. So about 10 years ago, when social media started to be started to become the hot new thing and it was being used as a marketing channel, um, I happened to be the youngest at an agency I was at. And so... Yeah, I remember my CEO coming to me and saying, hey, we have a client that wants social media. You're the youngest one here. Can you do it? I'm like, sure. I don't know how to use this for marketing, but I'll figure it out. So I read every book out there, You know, talked to a lot of people, downloaded so many like calendar templates and just really dove in. Um, and from there was able to build out this practice um, at a very young age. I still don't know why they trusted me with this job, but they did. Um, so started my career really in marketing through social media. Um, and then just from there have found these little facets of marketing that I find interesting. Um, and I've, my journey has been very much a result of just who I've been connected with. Um, and, you know, from doing social media, I dove in a little deeper. I went to a social media agency and then uh, came down here to Nashville to work in the music industry and do social media for artists. And then was using Emma, uh, tech, a software for our marketing and got connected with them and was beta testing their products and um, features on their platform. And they were hiring in marketing. And I said, you know what? This seems, I love the people. Uh, I'm going to give this a try. And so was there for over four years uh, before leaving and, you know, taking on new opportunities to help, you know, startups grow their marketing and digital presences. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so, and so you're here at yeah. the conference today. Yeah. Uh, the focus is on mental health. Mm-hmm. And so from the background you just described, you're, you're bringing this outsider's perspective yes. into behavioral health care yeah. marketing. So what, what what does that look like for you? Like using those eyes, that perspective, sure. what, what surprised you? So it's been really interesting. It's been a great learning experience. Um, first and foremost, coming from a software where you are marketing to marketers. Marketers are very smart, savvy people. They are up on the trends. They know all the gimmicks. You can't trick them. So I think um, you're doing this really forward, uh, future thinking type of marketing and you're having to be innovative. Um, What I've learned from 
being in the mental health space and, you know, the health space in general is that um, some of those trends that we see in the digital space or, you know, in technology aren't, haven't quite made it um, to that healthcare space. So it's just a space. step or two behind. It's a step or two behind, yeah. which is also great because there's a lot of learnings out there that, you know, marketers and healthcare space can take and implement into their programs. Like, well, you'll see specifically with email marketing, I see a lot of email, um, more of your newsletters, you know, those really long ones with like mm -hmm. multiple columns that you're like, I don't even know where yeah, to read. PDF. Exactly. Yeah. It'll be, yeah. So uh, things like that, um, you know, and, and SEO being, SEO actually has been the most challenging thing um, I've noticed as, from an outsider. You know, it's, it's really easy to pull keywords about email marketing. It's not so easy to pr pull keywords related to mental health. Um, you know, people aren't always searching those terms either. So what are those other... Um, um, keywords that you could be leveraging. So, so the it has general a, public may not even know not the even terms. No, exactly. Exactly. And that's why, you know, I've learned with being in the mental health space here, there's, there's a little bit of a gap when it comes to education mm -hmm. around mental health. And that's why, um, you know, Psych Hub is such a great mission trying to educate, educate uh, consumers about mental health but people don't know what to search for. So that's, I, I think, a unique challenge to this space um, and something that I think the industry will have to figure out how to you know, work with. But um, those have been the two things that have stood out with me the most, I think, through this experience. One, you know, when it comes to email, you're not seeing as many um, newer tactics being implemented. And, and they're not so new, but they're, uh, you know, I like to use the term human centric and you're not seeing a lot of that personalization or really the focus on the user experience. I think that's embedded very much in tech and not so much in healthcare. Um, but I do think that, so that's one piece of the puzzle. And then you have other channels like your website and trying to leverage SEO. Um, and it's hard because you're dealing with sensitive topics and words that people might not even know that they need to search for. So it's a totally different challenge than I think a lot of other industries, than a lot of other industries face. Yeah. And so you use the term human centric mm -hmm, mm -hmm. marketing. What, like, what does that look like in a, in a perfect world? What, what would that be? Sure. So I, I love data. Um, my team has, my teams have always laughed. Um, I'd much rather be in a spreadsheet than, um, you know, creating something. Don't ask me to go into Photoshop. It is okay. a disaster. Um, but so I think when you think about human centric, there's two aspects to, uh, you know, building a marketing campaign. One, you want to take the data um, that you have already, if you have it, look at research about your industry. But then I think there's this piece of um, doing customer discovery that is not always prioritized, but so important to help create those meaningful experiences. I think sometimes as marketers, especially we think, we think we know best because maybe we looked at the data and we think like, oh, this is the answer. Because we're the experts. Exactly. Yeah. And we're the experts. Yeah. People should like what we like, but that's really not the case. And so having that communication um, with your customers or your target audience and really understanding them and providing value to them is so important um, and getting feedback as well and really uncovering what drew people to certain content and then helping develop content based on those insights. And I think that that's a piece of the puzzle that isn't um, quite always prioritized in marketing is that discovery. So I'm really big on, you know, how can you make that a priority for your organization? Yeah. So you're, you're here speaking about yeah. email marketing yes. specifically. And I think it's interesting looking at email marketing because I feel like it's been around for so long. It's been, it I looked it up last night, like 40 years. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, so it's kind of like, what, why are we still talking about email marketing? Oh yeah, but, it's email but dead. It, yes. But it's, it's like the most effective <laughs> in really, a lot of ways. It so, is. so why is that? So I think it is, I, I love email and I like totally light up when I talk about it. Um, it's one of the few channels that's still really personal. And I'm giving this example in my talk, uh, you know, a little spoiler alert. But if you, I pulled a screenshot from my phone and there was an email from Nordstrom, an email from, I think the other one was Paper Source, and then an email um, about from Nashville Junior League and an email from my boyfriend about um, to our friend who is babysitting our dog. And so if you think about how powerful that is, your brand is sitting side by side with messages that are really important to me. I don't think you get that anywhere else. Um, with social media, I mean, you buy ads now. It doesn't feel like your own personal space. you can space. tell, like your brain exactly. can tell this You're like, is oh, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. You go onto Instagram, you can't tell me that that feels like, oh, that's my area. Like this, my news feed is mine. But I think with email, we still feel that ownership. And I think that's why it's such a, it can be such a powerful place. And when brands do email well, they will see those results. Hmm. Yeah. And so uh, another, another element of this is telling the story, uh -huh. at which when you're a brand, especially a brand in mm -hmm. the behavioral health space can be difficult to even figure out yeah. like what that story is. So mm -hmm. how, how do you help people 
A, discover what the story is and what they want to be telling, but then implement it and, and get it out there. Sure. So um, from more of a tactical perspective, and if we're looking at email, one of the best places to tell your story is right at the beginning. So we see this a lot. You know, you sign up for a newsletter. You get that first email back and it's, you know, thank you for signing up. Here's the promo code, whatever. A lot of um, organizations miss the mark um, and miss that that is an opportunity for you to start to build that relationship and tell your story to your new subscriber, which in the long run is going to help build that emotional connection. So one of the things um, and we did, we talked about this a lot during my time um, at Emma was extending that welcome, what we called a welcome series. So you have that first email that, you know, thank you for signing up. Here's your promo code. But then using those, you know, three to five next emails to really build that relationship. And you can tell your story that way. You know, what is your mission? Um, maybe tell customer stories or case studies are so powerful mm. because people also trust other people. They don't want to hear too much right. from the brand. Yeah. So as much as you can leverage those, it's really successful. Um, and then starting to show your subscriber, here are all our offerings and paying attention to that behavior. You know, is somebody clicking on, let's say you have um, an addiction center. Does somebody click on a specific location? That's a great, that person's indicating to you that I'm interested in that. And that's a great opportunity for personalized follow-up. Um, and then, you know, you can eventually ask for maybe some more information like somebody, Hey, can you update your email preferences so we can make sure we get you that right information? But you don't want to start that too early on because people don't know you. So I think when you're talking about telling a story and introducing yourself to your uh, new audience member, um, and if you're looking at it from an email perspective, there's a lot of opportunity in that those very first interactions to make that impact and build that relationship. Yeah. And so you touched on it earlier, the personalization mm -hmm. A part of this. So how how do you recommend that people use that? Use it well in, sure. in a way that's not overusing it or being yeah, yeah, creepy. It gets creepy or right? Yeah. 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 Um oh my gosh. I once got one email that was like had my first name, a last name, Belmont University where I did my MBA. Like all these really creepy things. I'm like, oh wow, this is my job title. Yeah. Way too much. I was like, oh buddy, this is too much. Um yeah, I don't know you. I don't yeah, know yeah. you. Um but what's really great about personalization. And I think we've, we think of it as first name and a subject line. That's not what personalization is about. Personaliz personalization is about being relevant. So there's different ways that you can do that. And I, um, I think the stat is about 50% of marketers don't feel like they can do personalization because they don't have clean data. You know, they don't have first name, last name in their email accounts. Because um, you don't want to get it wrong. You don't get it wrong. Oh my yeah. gosh, it's terrifying because yeah. then you'll have, end up with last name and you know, the <laughs> percentage sign and the yeah brackets. Yeah. But what is really cool is there's a lot of other tactics you can use um, that will give that subscriber a more relevant experience, I'd even argue, um, than plugging in data. So for example, one of the things, going back to that welcome series, that's a great example. That is an element that's being personal. That is creating a relevant experience. You are not sending that new subscriber an email you are sending to somebody who's been on your list for five years and knows your brand. You're being relevant to them. It's all about where they are in their journey with you as a brand. Yeah, so yeah, so it's less about them it's as their person, person. nor yeah, snotty. Exactly. It's more, more about, about, about their they? relationship yeah. with hmm. their brand. And if you go back to this idea of this human centric marketing approach, it's about knowing where your audience is and their relationship with your brand and making it all about them too. I think that's what we often as marketers, I think we we don't really think about that. It's our job to make our consumers' lives as easy as possible. And it, it the focus should be on them. I mean, think about it from a relationship perspective. Like no one wants to hang out with a friend that talks about themselves the whole time. You know, you want somebody who's interested in your life as well. Um, another way you could do personalization, um, I'm really loving this and it's based on um, real time delivery. Um, so when somebody receives the email, having content that is up to date. So for example, I'm going to show this shortly is uh, one organization was selling tickets to a conference and uh, they had a countdown in their email. Uh, and so it was based on whenever somebody opened that email, how much time was left for them to get that early bird discount. And it's very subtle, but it shows your consumer, your audience, that we care about where you are when you are opening this. And we want to get you the most up-to-date information. Because let's be serious, nobody's sitting there opening the email as soon as it's sent, you know? So it's providing that, it's being thoughtful about your consumer and your audience and making it the best experience possible for them and making sure it's relevant. So really at the end of the day, personalization is about being relevant. Yeah. And yeah. that's how you're going to yeah, build not about It's not a plug and play of data. Yeah. It's about being relevant and creating that experience. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. So bringing it back around yeah. to mental health, uh -huh. uh, what would be one thing 
kind of in a bigger picture sense, what one thing that you wish our culture, our country mm-hmm. understood better about about mental health, about healthcare? Sure. So I think the thing that has been so interesting from to me as um, you know, a mental health advocate and somebody who's a huge believer in people getting the care that they need um, was how the system doesn't really start with education. Um, I think that has become a big uh, piece of the puzzle that I'm really passionate about, you know, and that's Psych Hub's whole mission and why I um, was so excited to work with them and help them get their digital presence launched. Um, People don't know always what they're looking for. Like if I, I like to use the analogy, it's like asking people to ride a bike without training wheels. So you hear a lot of organizations say, tell your story, get help, tell your provider. Well, if people don't know the signs and people don't even know the words always to use, how are they going to feel comfortable telling their story and breaking the stigma or going to their provider to get help? So I think that that initial piece of getting that free education to people is just so crucial. Yeah. Or even understanding that something's wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then that there are options too. And like, you know, I think understanding types of therapies, you know, you, you people don't like to go therapies. They don't know what they're getting when they get, they're like, oh, am I going to sit on a couch? And, you know, so there, there's great evidence-based practices out there that people should know about when they enter into that journey. Um, so yeah, I think education, I wish people um, understood that's okay to go look for information um, and get educated on these topics. Yeah. All right. So for someone who wants to dive deeper mm-hmm. into the education on, on this subject, what would be a book, a resource that, you, that you'd recommend for them sure. to follow Sure. Well, I will, of course, say, mention Psych Hub. Um, go to psychhub.com, watch some free videos. Um, great. Everything is clinically sound, trauma-informed. You know, you know you're getting good content. I think one of the other challenges with mental health um, is you don't always know what you're getting online, like any health information. Um, but then also, you know, uh, MHA is a great resource. NAMI, um, Jed Foundation, all have very credible resources to learn more. Yeah, yeah. And so to wrap up with this last one, Mm -hmm. what would be a favorite piece of advice? Something that's meant a lot to you that that you'd want to pass on? So my mother, (laughs) you know, when you're younger, you're like, oh, I'm not... Don't listen, mom. She doesn't know anything. The the older I get, I'm like, oh no, she was actually pretty wise. Um, Or she is actually pretty wise. Uh, She told me, talk to everybody you meet because everyone has a really interesting story and listen. Um, And it's been so great for so many, especially, I mean, you hear such powerful stories in this space and it really helps put life um, in perspective a lot of times. But I also think about as a marketer, you know, listening to what, you know, consumers want and providing that good experience. Like as we don't always, as marketers, sometimes we just think we have to do a job, but we actually get the privilege of communicating with people who are spending their time and their money with our brands. And that's really powerful. And we don't always look at it from that lens. Um, so, you know, listening to them and then, you know, what, I feel like I've been so fortunate in my career and the network that I've built and the opportunities I've had. And that's all because I've not been afraid to just talk to people and introduce myself and listen and hear what they're doing. Even if it's nothing related to marketing, you never know. And that's, I mean, I I got my first job because I went into an art gallery and I just started talking to the artist and her husband owned a a marketing agency and I ended up going to work there. So um, that's just, that piece of advice has opened a lot of doors for me and has made me just, you know, a happier person and better at my job as well. So yeah, because you never know where you never know. Exactly. Like this. (laughs) Nora Snoddy is a marketing strategy consultant based in Nashville, Tennessee. And in addition to her work with growth and email marketing, she has also served as director of marketing for Psych Hub, an online platform for behavioral health education. Check out their resources at psychhub.com. Beyond Theory is produced, written, and edited by me, David Kondos. You can discover more from this podcast, including extended videos of each conversation at beyondtheorypodcast.com. Finally, thank you for listening. And I hope you'll join us again next time for another episode of Beyond Theory. Beyond Theory.